Amen. Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word this morning, let me invite you to take it out, or maybe you have a a device you're using. We're in 1 John, and we find ourselves in the second chapter. One of the things that uh, I've always enjoyed doing uh, in the ministry and being a part of church, being a pastor, is going uh, on mission trips, uh, both nationally and internationally. And and one of the things you learn when you go on an international mission trip is that you want to spend some time trying to understand the culture that you're about to enter into. Uh, because every culture is different. Uh, the foods that they eat, the customs that they have, and, and you want to make sure that you have some understanding. You want to learn basic things like how do you ask for the restroom? That's important, right? You want to ask, like, what, what's, what is this I'm eating, right? Like, you want to ask those questions. It, there's a lot of things that go into it, but one of the things that you must be sure of when you're traveling is how does that culture deal with time? How do they tell time? Now, I don't mean as in how do they read the clock or what time zone you're in. I mean, what is their concept of following time? In America, here in our first world country, we are very time-driven. We are very deadline-driven. We live by calendars. We live by clocks. We live by appointments. We follow the time. We understand time. We are often, to our own detriment, slaves to time. But in other cultures, that's not the case. I was down in a village in Guatemala many years ago, and I had the privilege of preaching at this church a couple of days in a row. And the first day I was going to preach was Sunday, and the pastor said, well, we start at 10. So when you're the visiting pastor at any church, especially in our culture, you you want to show up about a half hour early just to make sure that everything is okay, that the church is ready for you, that they have any questions. You don't want to make them feel nervous. So I showed up about 930, and there was nobody there. We got out of our van, me and the team that was with us, and the church doors were locked. We could not get in. So we waited, and we waited. And about 10 o'clock, the pastor came walking up the village road, and he greeted us, and he opened the door. And then about 10.05, 10.10, 10.20, some of the musicians began to come in. Then some of the crowd began to come in, and they began to sing and play, and others trickled in along the way, and they would talk to one another, they would pray, they would join in singing. And the service, I don't really know when it started. But I know, brothers and sisters, that they told me it started at 10, and I didn't get up to preach till 1 o'clock, and I was hungry. (laughs) Now, you might think to yourself, well, you must have preached a quick sermon. Uh Uh-uh. They treated me that way. I held them hostage for an hour and a half. (laughs) I'm kidding. I did not. But it's not their fault. It was my fault. I didn't understand the time. For them, the doors opened at 10. Church began when they gathered. It was an all-day event in that village. You gathered, you fellowshiped, you worshiped. That wasn't their fault. It was mine. I didn't understand the time. In John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, John will reference this word, last hour. And he will remind us of the time. He will call us to understand what time we are living in. He's not thinking chronologically about the hours on the clock. He's thinking about the time in God's spiritual clock of where we are. And he will draw the church in and he will say, we are in the last hour, be diligent, watch out. In fact, he will use this language of last hour in order to warn us about being led astray. Over the verses, uh, 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18 through verse 25, John will warn the church about a group of people who came in, who began to teach heretical doctrine, who left and was now trying to entice people to leave the true gospel and go their way. And John will say there in your Bible in verse 8, he will say, children, it is the last hour. He is literally saying, we are near the end, don't get led astray. He will give us a warning. I pray this morning as we unpack God's word, you will hear the urgency of John's voice writing to us. You will hear that this is not one of those moments where we just say amen and we depart, but we think seriously and sober-mindedly about the urgency of the moment. And we will be warned. We will be on our guard 
not to be led astray. Look with me, if you will, in your copy of God's Word. You follow along with me. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. Children, remember that's John's affectionate way of speaking to the church, so he's talking to us. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Let's pray together. Father, this morning we ask you, Lord, to help us understand what it means, Lord, to live in these last hours and how we are to stay diligent not to be led astray. Father, I pray that you would give us uh, just clear minds this morning, focus our attention. We certainly, Father, want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We don't want to lose it here at the end of the clock, Father, at the, the sun setting. And so, Lord, help us. Especially, Father, when we look around us and the world is marching as fast as it can away from you, Lord, help us to hold firm to the truth. Encourage us, Father. Strengthen us. Lord, I pray for those that are in this room today that, Lord, they need to know you personally. They need to cry out to you. They need to be saved by you. Lord, I pray they would hear. We're in the last hour. Be ready, be watchful. Today is the day. Father, bless our time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John is speaking of the end times, but he's speaking of the end times as in the clock has already started. There is much speculation about the end times. What will it be like and what will happen and and where will it go? And we read prophecies in the book of Daniel or in the book of Revelation and we, we try to think about what it's happening and certainly we should as the church. But John is not interested in speculation or trying to map out the end time. John is interested in telling us with urgency, we're in it. The clock is close. The moment is here. It's coming. And what he means by this is that with Christ's coming the first time, his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of the Father, that the clock has started for his return. That at any moment, the Lord Jesus could return. That the sky could split, the trumpet could sound, and God, or Christ himself, could appear in the sky. So by the spiritual clock of the kingdom, we are in the last chapter of the book. We are in the fourth quarter, the ninth inning. The sun is setting. We are in the last hour. Now, John is not writing this to give us specific days or times. He's not saying to us, count the clock, it's going to happen. He's writing to us to give us an urgency. He's writing to us to give us a clarity. But more than anything, he's writing this section to say to us, because we're in the last hours, because it's soon that Christ will return, because at any moment God could finish the consummation of the world, be on your guard for false teachers are rising. What does this mean? This means, brothers and sisters, if you are Satan and you are losing the battle, and at the resurrection of Christ, you know that your end is inevitable, and you know that you are a wounded animal going down, and you know that when the Lord returns, his boot will be on your neck, then what you simply want to do is confuse and destroy and take as many with you as possible. So in these last hours, Satan is working overtime, if you will, to pull people away from the truth of the gospel. And John is writing to the church, the children of God, saying, don't be led astray. Don't fall into the trap because of this. Now, he will give us three warnings in this text. So I give them to you this morning to help guard your heart in these last 
hours. Truth number one, don't be led astray by false teachers. Because we are in the last hours, don't be led astray by false teachers. In fact, John will use the evidence of last hours based on the evidence of false teachers. He will say, there are many false teachers, therefore we're in the last hours. He will connect those together. In the countdown of the clock of the return of Christ, there will be a bubbling up of those who will try to lead you astray. Now notice there in your Bible at verse 18, the words that John uses. He will use the word antichrist, and he will use it two times, and he will use one singular and one plural. He will say to us, you have heard the antichrist is coming. Now, when we understand the word antichrist in the Bible, and this is not the text in order to explain this, but there is in the Bible this singular figure that will play a role in the end times. Paul would refer to this as the man of lawlessness. The book of Revelation has this picture of one who leads people away and demands worship and pulls us from God. But that's not who John is speaking of specifically here. In fact, if you notice in verse 18, he says the word antichrist, and then he says, but I say to you, many antichrists, and notice with me your English Bible, it is a lowercase word, meaning it's not one person, it's not a proper noun, and two, it is a plural word, meaning there are lots of them. So John is talking about many who have come into the church, and, and here's the definition. I'm about to blow your mind. Just, just stay with me. I'm going to just wow you. Antichrist means anti-Christ. Woo, brother. <laughs> now, Robbie, you won't believe this, but that took me two days of studying to figure out right there. And there are those who had come into the church and began to teach opposite of the testimony of the apostles concerning Christ. They are anti-Christ. If you go against the Christ of the Bible, the testimony of the apostles, if you teach against that, then you are anti that, you are opposite that, you are enemies of the one true Christ. So antichrists are all around us. They're all around us. And so John has in mind, because we're in the last hours, to be diligent of who you listen to because there are those who will lead you away from the one true Christ. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 19. He says in verse 19, he's talking about this group, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be become plain they were not of us. It's kind of redundant, is it not? He's pushing us to understand that he has been pulled away. We have been pulled from those. There were those who went out to teach something different. Now, the Bible says that there was this group here that John is dealing with that have come into the church, and he's already been dealing with this in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. There are those that have come into church, and they began denying the testimony of John about Christ. Now, John is the last living apostle Apostles were those who were the eyewitness of the resurrection Savior, given the task of recording for us the eyewitness. So when you hold in your hand the Bible and that New Testament, when you hold in your hand Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and so forth, you are holding the testimony of the apostles. Those who saw Jesus resurrected, the eyewitness accounts of those who walked with Jesus recorded for us so that 2,000 years later, we can still know the truth about Jesus. And there were those who had come into the church that John was overseeing, and they began to teach a different Jesus. They began to teach things like Jesus was not all God in the flesh, that he was a man from Nazareth, and the Spirit of God fell on him and anointed him and made him special, but he was not God in the flesh. They would view Jesus much like Moses, a special man that God anointed for a task, but they would not view him as the divine Son of God, fully man and fully God. Now hear me, church, and don't miss this. If Jesus is not fully God, then he could not pay the penalty of sin for all the world. And if he's not fully man, he could not step in for us, for we are man. He is fully God and fully man, and if you get that wrong, you do not know Jesus. And so John says, there are those who have come into the church. In fact, if you look down just a little bit further, he will say they deny, verse 23, the one who denies the Son. They deny him. They're liars, he would call them. So there are those who would come into the church and began to teach that Jesus is not the real one. Now, this is scary. 
Because the way John describes this in verse 19, there are those who were in the church, they were part of the church, they had confessed, they might have been baptized, they might have sang in the choir, they might have given offering, they might have led prayers, but at some point along the way, they began to teach opposite of the testimony of the apostles, they began to go against the word of God revealed to us in scripture, and they began to go their own way, and they left the church. You know why this is scary? Because the visible church and the true church may not be the same thing. Those we see and say are part of the church may not actually be a part of the church because to be a part of the church doesn't mean you're visibly with us. It means you are with Christ. And so he says, there were those who came in and began to teach this heresy. Now, we can spot this pretty clearly in our culture today. If you were to Google and read about the documents of the founding of the Mormon church, you will find it is heresy. They are not of us. They are not Christians. They are not part of the kingdom of God. Why? Because the Mormon teaching believed that Jesus Christ was the firstborn spirit child of the heavenly father and the heavenly mother. That's not the Bible. That's not in scripture. That's a different Jesus. That's not the Jesus of the New Testament. Well, we can see this among the Jehovah Witness. The Jehovah Witness believe that Jesus is the first direct creation of God. That God made Jesus and then Jesus made everything else. That's not the Bible. That is a trinity-denying, divine-refuting uh, Jesus. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. We can see this in modern culture, but we can see it even more simple than that. We can see it in the preacher who calls us out to believe that Jesus is a God, some God, one of the gods, or that all roads lead to God. If your preacher stands up and says, Jesus is for me, but it might not be the answer for everybody else, that ain't the Jesus of the Bible. That's not the gospel. That's a different Jesus. I wept this week as I watched the United Methodist Church, the people of John Wesley, stand up and say that the Jesus of the Bible affirms homosexuality, that the Jesus of the Bible affirms homosexual priests, that the Jesus of the Bible is rewriting Scripture. Brothers and sisters, they might be one of the largest denominations in the United States, but they do not have the authority to rewrite the Bible. It's a different Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. And just by way of footnote, I am so thankful for the conservative, faithful Methodists who have decided we will not walk with them. And I pray a revival breakout in the Methodist church and that God will spread his kingdom around the world because I'm thankful for the hymnal of John Wesley. I'm thankful for the leg legacy of the Methodist writer. I'm not going to sprinkle a baby, but I'll eat chicken with him anytime. But it's a different Jesus. It's a different Jesus. There were those who appeared and taught them. So let me give you just some warnings here about false teachers. One, we are warned to be diligent when it comes to the clear teaching of the apostles. We are to be diligent. Every sermon, every book, every reel, every social media, every post we make, every clip, everything that's shared, we are to be diligent. Does this line up with the apostles' witness in the New Testament? I want to just be clear with you. Every book in the store under the heading Christian is not Christian. Every preacher on the TV is not Christian. Every reel is not Christian. I am a fallible man. I will preach to you the Bible verse by verse, but if you ever hear me say something opposite of this, call me out. Why? Because I don't want to drift away from the testimony of the apostles. And these literally, we must be diligent. How do you spot a false teacher? Let me just give you a couple of warnings from here. One, a false teacher will always leave the church. John says they were of us. They went out from us. They did not come back. Joseph Smith was of us. He went out from us. He did not come back. The Jehovah Witnesses were of us. They went out from us. They did not come back. The United Methodists were of us. They're going out from us. They did not come back. They'll always leave the church. Number two, they will deny the testimony of Scripture. Verse 24 says, you've known it from the beginning, but yet they'll come up with something new. And then verse 22, they will reject that Jesus is God. They will reject that Jesus is God. We must be diligent to hold to the apostles' teaching. Another warning in this about these teachers is we must be warned about diligently keeping unity. In verse 18 and 19, we are warned that unity is fragile. Do you know how much we have to give up to be unified as Brushy Creek Baptist Church? We have to give up a lot of stuff together. 
Some of you wish that the temperature in this room was colder. You are people after my own heart. Some of you wish the temperature was warmer. You are people who will get into the kingdom and be corrected. (laughs) But you give up your preference. Some of you wish that the music was quieter. Some of you want it to be louder. Some of you want it to be faster. Some of you want it to be slower. Some of you wish I'd preach two hours. I love you. Amen. (laughs) No, we're all in agreement. That's not the way, right? We have preferences we give up in the church. Some of you think we ought to do missions this way or work with children this way, and that's fine. We're a bunch of individuals with opinions trying to serve the Lord. But listen to me and understand what verses 18 and 19 say. There are many things that we will disagree on and still hold unity, but there are certain things we will not disagree on and hold unity, and we will not, as the church, disagree on that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, fully God and fully man, the only hope for salvation. And if you walk away from that truth, you are not a part of our church, you are not a part of the church, and you are in trouble in your eternity. And so he says, look at verse 19, notice the language. They, 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 us, us, us. There's two groups of people. Those with Christ and those anti And the dividing factor is how you view Christ. So let me ask you, how do you view Christ? Have you come to the place in your life where Christ is the Savior of your soul and your heart? He is the resurrected King, God in the flesh, who died on the cross and was buried and rose from the grave. Have you come to a place in your life where you believe the testimony of the apostles given to us in Scripture? Because, brothers and sisters, if you don't believe the story of Scripture, if you've not come to Christ, if you've not confessed Christ, you might be moral, you might be clean cut, you might be a good neighbor, but you are anti Christ. Christ if you don't know it. That's not where you need to be. So we must be careful and diligent about unity, holding to unity. And then let me give you one more warning in this idea of these false teachers. We are to be warned about those who leave Jesus because verse 19 tells me they never knew him. I want to speak to you pastorally here for a moment. Would you look at verse 19 with me one more time? I want to speak with a heavy heart to you right here. Verse 19 They went out from us, but they were not of us. For it had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain they were not of us. The Bible tells us that God sees man's heart and we see the outside. We are not the arbiter of salvation. We are not the one who decides who's in the kingdom and who is not. That is the spirit of God and God himself who determines that. But what happens in the church is that we look for outer experiences and hold to them. And sometimes we hold to them with good intentions and deep emotions, but we're just biblically wrong. And let me tell you what I mean. What I mean by this is, is that all of us know people who at one point in their life claimed to worship and know Jesus. They claim to have been saved. It might have been your son, your daughter, your spouse, your neighbor. And at some point in their life, maybe at a young age, they claimed Christ, they were baptized, yet they left the church, they left the faith. There is no evidence in their life that Jesus is their Lord. There is no evidence in their life that he has changed them. There is no evidence in their life that they want to follow him, obey him, or believe him. And oftentimes, brothers and sisters, we will comfort ourselves in a false conversion instead of knowing that verse 19 says if they were with us, they would be with us. So instead of calling them backslidden or prodigal, maybe we should call them lost and share the gospel with them. Maybe, brothers and sisters, your daughter and your son is not wayward from God. Maybe they never knew God, and you should be begging the Lord to save their soul. There is no such thing as losing salvation because Christ is the Savior. But there is a thing of not knowing salvation and leaving and not coming back. And so I speak to you with a heavy heart because I'm the one that does the funerals. 
I'm the one that you'll come to and say, well, preacher, at nine years old, they were in church, but they just never really went to church the rest of their life, and they made bad decisions, but I know they were saved, and maybe they were, and God only knows, but don't ask me to stand up and preach them into heaven if their knife never showed it. Let's share the gospel with them that they may be of us and not against us. We are walking among a society of people who are dead in their trespasses and sin, and we are in the last hour. And so let us stop playing with our emotional comforts and take serious that if they were with us, they would have stayed in the faith. Brothers and sisters, please let us hear the words of Jesus And the farmer, some of the seed fell on hard soil, and some fell among the thorns, and some fell in the sun, but only one fell in the true soil. It may look like the gospel, but there's only one gospel. Oh God, let us take serious this who's your one, and let's go share the gospel with people who need to know Jesus Christ. Let me give you a second warning from the text. Because we're in the last hours, don't be led astray by false teachers. Because we are in the last hours, don't be led astray by new teachings. Look at verse 20 and 23. He will say, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father. John tells us in in, in verses 18 and 19, here's what it looks like to be a false teacher. And in verse 20 through 23, he says, here's what it looks like to have true confession. And he's warning us. Why? Because he tells us in verse 20, look there in verse 20. He says, who is the liar but the one who denies Jesus, that is Christ, the Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son? I'm sorry, I read the wrong verse. Look at verse 20. There it is. But you have anointed, excuse me, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. John says, listen, I saw Jesus, I heard Jesus. I watched him resurrected from the dead. The Spirit of God fell on me. I recorded it for you. I planted the church. I told you the testimony. You have the full story. You have all knowledge of the gospel. There is no secret level of Christianity that you have not discovered yet. There is no secret level of spiritualism that you have not found. If you know the story of Jesus, you have all the story. Now, does that mean we don't stop learning and growing and seeking? Certainly we do, because God is all knowledge, and he is deeper than we could ever imagine. But brothers and sisters, the beauty of the gospel is this. It is so shallow, a child can wade in it, and so deep, an adult can never find its bottom. It is known to us, and yet it is unknown to us. But John is being very clear here. You don't need a new preaching You have the gospel. So how does this matter? Because there is not a day that goes by that there isn't someone on the internet or on the TV or some book on the shelf that tells us they have a new revelation, a new word, a new fresh beginning, something undiscovered. Listen to me. If you ever hear a preacher say, I found something brand new in the Bible, run as fast as you can from that church. We don't find brand new things. We find the old, old story. We find the story of Jesus that's written on our heart, every word. John says, you know the truth. You don't need a new teaching. You don't need a shiny object. You don't need to look somewhere else. Just stay with the old story. Verse 24, the story you have heard from the beginning. Verse 27, you have no need that anyone should teach you. Now, I know what you're thinking. If I don't need anyone to teach me, can we wrap this sermon up? That's not what he means. What he means is is that I'm not bringing you anything new. I'm bringing you the same story over and over and over. And brothers and sisters, week after week, we need to hear the story over and over and over. We need the daily bread over and over and over. Why? Because it is the story that saves our soul. Now notice verse 20 again. He says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. This is his reference to the Holy Spirit. He says, listen, the Holy Spirit came upon you. The Holy Spirit convicted you of your sin. The Holy Spirit illuminated Christ. The Holy Spirit showed you that the testimony of Christ is true. You don't need anybody else telling you something different. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the testimony of Jesus. You have the Bible. You have the Holy Spirit. You know the story. You don't need to look anywhere else. You don't have to go anywhere else. You don't have to find something new. Look at verse 21. 
I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. If you know the story of Jesus and you have the Bible and the Holy Spirit lives in you, then whatever they're telling you is a lie and that's not of God. And so he says, don't be led away by some new teaching. Don't be led away by some new story. Hold to the truth. As Jude would write, the faith once passed down for all. Hold to the truth. You must hold to the truth. But I want to draw your attention to two verses here because I don't want you to miss it. Look at verse 23. Here's the truth. Here's what it is. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father. Now, John is very redundant and very clear. If you want a relationship with God the Creator, you must know God the Son. If you don't know God the Son, you don't know God the Creator. This is why, brothers and sisters, we grieve for the Muslims around the world that do not know Jesus and have not heard of him. We grieve for the Buddhist and the Hindu and the Mongolians in their tribes and the Amazon. We grieve for the world that doesn't know Christ. This is why we collect offerings and send missionaries. Why? Because if they don't know Jesus, they can't know God. You must know Jesus to know God. This is why we grieve for the Mormon and the Jehovah Witness because they don't know Jesus. Therefore, they can't know God. This is why we grieve for the atheist in New York and the neighbor across the street. Why? Because if you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. This is why we weep for the Jew. Because if you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. John is very clear. You must know the Son in order to know the Father. So let me ask you. Do you know the Son? Because, brothers and sisters, if you've never come to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, death, buried, and resurrected, then you do not know God. You may know about God. You may know lessons around God. You may know the songs that you sing for God. You may even voice prayers to God. But if you don't know Jesus, you do not know God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. There is one way to know the Father, and that is through the Son. Why? Because Jesus said, he who knows the Father is the one that has descended from heaven in order that we might ascend to heaven. If you don't know the one who's descended, you'll never know how to ascend. You must know the Father. Calvin would write it this way. He would say, the Father cannot be separated from the Son. Herman Bavnik, the Dutch theologian, writes this way. He says, Christ is Christianity itself. He stands not outside of it, but the center of it. With his name, his person, and his work, there is no Christianity left. In a word, Christ does not point the way to salvation. He is the way itself. Without Christ, you cannot know God. But listen to verse 23. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father. If you know Christ... You know God. The creator of the world knows you. And that leads me to my third and final truth, and that's simply this. Because we're in the last hours, don't be led astray by false teachers. Don't be led astray by new teachings. And finally, because we're in the last hours, don't be led astray by false promises. Look at verse 24 and 25. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made us eternal Life. This is what John says. John says, here's the truth. If you know Jesus, then you know the Father. And if you know Jesus and the Father, you have two promises given to you right here in this text. One, you get to be in abiding relationship with God Almighty. You get to have communion with God the Father and Jesus his Son. You get to have a relationship with the creator of the world and the Savior of mankind. And two, look at the very last words of verse 25, and you get eternal life. Now hear me as I close, which means nothing, by the way. <laughs> hear me now. Whatever the world may promise you. I've, I've read the Mormon faith. I've read the Jehovah Witness faith. They can promise you worlds and gods and celestial homes. I've read the the TV preacher that tells me that God wants to give me health and wealth and everything all along in this world. I've listened to the liberal theologian that tells me God just wants me to experience love and I can love anybody any way I want to love it. That's what God wants to give me. Brothers and sisters, listen to me carefully. Those are false promises from a non-existing dead God. 
This tells me that when you know the one true God and his one true son, then you will have one overarching promise. He will walk with you and you will walk with him and he will deliver you unto eternal life. So I don't need health or wealth. I don't need the right politician or the country lines. I don't need any of that. I've got Jesus. I've got a home in eternity. I've got God in my heart. I know for sure the promises of Christ. Why? Because he is the one true Savior. So, brothers and sisters, let us hold to the true promises. Verse 25, eternal life. What's your answer for death? I I don't want to be somber this morning. Y'all been amen and well. We've been excited about Jesus. I don't want to take you down a road of depression, but I want to let you in on a secret. You're going to die. What's your answer? How will you face it? You see, the world may offer you all kind of promises, but Jesus is offering you eternal life. In fact, Jesus himself said, John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. John, who wrote the gospel of John, the testimony of the apostle, the one that he's defending here. He said, hey, I've already told you all about Jesus. Don't go away from it. He wrote the the, the gospel of John, the story of Jesus. And he gets all the way to the very end of the gospel, John chapter 20, verse 31. And he says, here's why I wrote all this down. I wrote this down, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. He said, I told you all about Jesus, so you'll have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to be led astray by a false gospel because I don't want to listen to false teachers who tell me new shiny things because all I want is the old, old story of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. Why? Because that old, old story is attached to a living Savior who's going to deliver me into eternity, and I don't need to look anywhere else. And so he tells us, this is the promises you lean on. I don't have to be enticed by this world. Just... Give me, as we sing, when I come to die, give me Jesus. That's what he says. So what do I see in this text? Let me give you two final words. One, I see a call to the unbeliever. Brother and sister, listen to me. I love you. I'm so glad you're here this morning. I want you to know I love you, but I want you to know something even greater. God loves you. God loves you and sent his son to die for you. That Jesus is the only way for your sins to be forgiven and for you to be given eternal life. If you want to die without fear and know you'll live forever, then you must listen to the words of John. He who has the Son has the Father. If you come to Jesus today, right now, in this place, Jesus is calling you. You can be saved and have eternal life. And you can be with us in the kingdom and not with they that's headed to destruction. And then there's a second word I want to say, and that's to you who are in the room that are believers. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. No matter how, world, no matter how the world may look, it looks like your neighbor's prospering. It looks like the, the other side's winning. It looks like the world's falling apart. It looks like you can't catch a break and everything's going the wrong way and you're trying to be faithful. Be encouraged because no matter how bad it may be, you have the Son, you have the Father, you abide with God, and you have eternal life. And there is nothing better than that. So be encouraged. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for the truth. Man, what an exciting morning of worship at Brushy Creek Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Corey, and I want to say thank you for joining us online. What a blessing it is to have you tune in and worship the Lord with us. At Brushy Creek, we're a place that's always trying to offer hope and build community. And my prayer is that we've helped do that for you this morning. I want to invite you to come join us some Sunday at Brushy Creek. We'd love to have you be our guest. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see ways in which you can contact us and let us know you're coming. Or maybe you have a prayer request or a need or some way we can help you find hope and build community. We're not a perfect church. We're not perfect people. But we serve a perfect Savior, and we'd love for you to come join us on that journey. I hope you have a great week, and God bless you.